Thank you. Um, yeah, being a short staff the way we are up at Kinzer Dam um, beats me and another ranger. So <laughs> it was either a choice between, since I took the call, I volunteered for it. So I'm the natural resource manager at Kinzer Dam. So I'm the one that oversees the operation of the dam, make sure it functions correctly and make sure that everything's going correctly. So, and I have the staff at the dam is me and a ranger, park ranger, because we have a ranger staff. And we can hire a summer ranger in the summertime, a seasonal, it's usually a college student, and we have two maintenance persons. So that's it on our staff. So it's kind of a short staff. But, uh, so we'll get into it. Um, just an idea of, the Pittsburgh District, because we're part of the Pittsburgh District Corps of Engineers, this kind of gives you an idea of exactly all the places that the district does manage. And of course, we are right there, Kinzu Dam. You probably know a few of the other ones around the area. East Branch Dam, Tynesta Dam. Um, you have Woodcock Creek Dam, Shenango. Uh, that probably Kerwin, Berlin, Mosquito. Then you have all the all the locks on the river on the Allegheny. Then we go the whole way down into West Virginia to um, Tigert and I'm drawing a blank. Then there's Yakagani. Long Hannah Conema, Crooked Creek, Mahoning. So there's a few of them out there that are under the Corps of Engineers out of Pittsburgh District. But you can kind of see basically what my job is to make sure that anything below the, this area, we have a group of individuals down in Pittsburgh who manage all the waterways, all those projects, all those flood control projects they make sure that nothing down here floods. So they make sure Pittsburgh stays high and dry and anywhere down below stays high and dry also. So Kinzu has a total area that the lake is 26,541 acres. So a large lake. Our drainage area, the water that drains into the Allegheny River and flows up into New York and flows back into Pennsylvania, our drainage area is 2,180 square miles. So that's why we're so big, because we have such a vast area that we have to collect the water in and make sure it doesn't flood downstream. Oops, wrong way. Um, this kind of gives you an idea of just the reservoir itself. We are right here, the dam is right on this part of the reservoir. The Kinzu arm comes up, basically comes in down around Kane, flows north up into the dam. Then the Allegheny River, which starts and goes up and comes back around. So this, the reservoir is 91 miles of shoreline. And most of it is up, well, we, it's divided up between New York and Pennsylvania. Most of the land around the reservoir in, in Pennsylvania is National Forest land, Allegheny National Forest. And most of the land that surrounds the reservoir up in New York is either we lease out to the Allegheny State Park, which is New York State Parks, or it's tribal land, Seneca Nation of Indians owns the land around the reservoir up there. So as for what the Corps of Engineer has is a very small limited area right here at the dam of, of land that we actually own. Um, there is a few chunks of land up in New York, like I said, that we lease out to other entities. Um, Oneville Marina, I don't know if you have anybody knows of Onavale Marina, but that's Corps of Engineer land that we lease out to the Cattaraugus County in New York, and they operate the docks and campground in that area. Um, then, like I said, 
some of the other areas or wildlife areas that is, is run and operated by New York State Wildlife. So, when they built the dam, the purpose of the dam was flood control, of course. Um, the major concern was make sure flooding downstream doesn't happen, making sure that there's water for navigation. So they want to make sure that in the summertime, when there's drought, if there's a drought downstream, that we can supply water through the dam that we've held so that they can run barges up and down the river so that they can get goods and supplies of where they need to go. Power generation, um, that is there. It's not one of the main reason, main things for us, but like a, the, we do have a power plant connected to the dam, but it is not run by the Corps of Engineers. It is run by a private entity. LS Power is the name of the company that runs it. It's called Seneca Generation and we'll talk about that later, but that's that big circle on top of the hill is, is theirs and we'll discuss how that works. Pollution abatement is another big thing why we're here. Because anybody know the old saying, solution to pollution is dilution? <laughs> that's our job. So if, because when the dam was built, made, there was all kinds of mine drainage coming out of the hillsides from all the mining that's gone over the years. And of course, you have septic systems that go into the reservoir. And when the water got low in the summertime, all that, all that debris got, nasty stuff got concentrated with low water and it made the water bad. So our job is to make sure that there's more water in there to dilute that and send it on downstream. So off it goes. And of course, recreation, because People love to be around water. You know, everybody goes boating and fishing and sailing. So recreation is a big part of it and that was one of our major objectives is to make sure. Pre-construction history of Kinzu Dam, 1794 through 1960. It's very important that we discuss that because most of you know of the, uh, there's a little bit of background to Kinzu Dam at, didn't go over well with a lot of people during the age when they were going to build it. So we'll get into that. In seven, 1794, the Canadaga Treaty was a treaty that was also called the Pickering Treaty. And it was signed by President George Washington and the Seneca Nation chief at that time. And we signed an agreement with the Native Americans at that time that they helped us fight in the war, that we would leave the land on the Upper Allegheny to them to live at and to have throughout their entire, till the, the wind stopped blowing and the land stops growing. So they were supposed to have that for eternity. But, we started getting floods, the St. Tra Patrick's Day flood of 1936, which basically was whenever most of the flood controls was started throughout the country. Um, this is just down in Pittsburgh, 47 people died, $50 million in damage to Pittsburgh alone. And at this point, the people were up in arms, they needed a way to control control the river systems. So most of the dams that you'll see that I talked about earlier were built in that time from a little bit beyond 1940s or so, 1936 through 1940s was a big kick in building the dams so that they could stop that flow of water coming downstream. And of course they wanted to build a dam on the mainstream of the Allegheny River to stop that, but with the native, the treaty with the Seneca Nation, they said that no, you can't build a dam here because of the treaty. So they kind of sat back, said nope, can't really do that. But as time rolled on, they didn't build the dam, and they were planning, still planning on building the dam, and then 19, 
mid-1940s rolled around and they had other things to spend their money on besides building dams in the 1940s. Everybody knows what that is. World War I set in, or I'm sorry, World War II set in. And that kind of put a damper on building of dams in the country because we needed the, the money to fight the war. So, but after the war, these gentlemen built, decided they had an Allegheny Conference com Community Development in downtown Pittsburgh to get Pittsburgh up and going. You know, at that point it was the Steel City and they were starting to build, things were taking off, they wanted to make Pittsburgh, but they were still worried that all their work was going to be not if they got another big flood. So if you look at some of the members, it's like a who's who of who was involved in getting all this done. We all know Richard Mellon, the Mellon Bank, H.J. Hines, Hines ketchup, Hines mustard, Hines everything. Um, the Westinghouse board members, we all know Westinghouse TVs and Westinghouse this and that. Kaufman, well, Kaufman stores are not there too much anymore, but that was pretty big. And David L. Lawrence, who was, who was mayor of the city of New York, I mean Pittsburgh, sorry. Right, exactly. So he's the one that kind of guided everybody into keeping this city safe from flooding. So he wasn't actually part of the community development, but he was the main driver of it to get them to do what, what he wanted done. So when these people got involved, they started getting a little bit more interested in getting Kinzu built. Then, so happens, the, the flood of 1956 came along and that kind of just tipped the scales that we needed, that something needed to be done to stop the flooding because there was $4.5 million in damages from the flood of 1956. Basically, all that was basically town of Warren and downstream from that. But, so they decided that we needed a dam, so they looked at multiple ways, to, multiple areas to put in the dam, and the Corps decided that, of course they got the Corps of Engineers involved because the Corps of Engineers was the dam builders. The dam builders picked the spot where it's at now, and that's where they wanted to build it. They figured that was the perfect, the depth of the bedrock was only 75 feet there, so it was easy to dig down and get hit the bedrock to anchor the dam to. It was at a curve of the river where there would be a lot of storage. But, of course, the water upstream would flood, would take over and inundate a lot of Seneca Nation tribal lands. But, so the Seneca Nation fought it, took it to Congress, fought it along the way, and came up with multiple plans and this was another plan that was was decided on that the the nation decided this was the best way to go Dr. Dr. Albert Morgan had the Conowongo plan he wanted to divert the flood the water from the Allegheny River across to Lake Erie and that way it wouldn't flow down to to Pittsburgh at all just a little bit from New York State down would flow to Pittsburgh. Everything above New York would flow, flow into the Lake Erie. It would save tribal land, but it would be they would have no water saved up for navigation, which of course the powers that be down in Pittsburgh would, needed their navigation to get their coal moved and to get their goods and services to go. And of course, no water for pollution abatement. So it was a good plan. That's the plan that the Seneca Nation wanted to go for with, but the political powers once again said, nope, not going to happen. And this kind of gives you an idea. Before, before the Ice Age, you kind of look, and this was the Erie Basin 
here's where Warren is. Actually, am I right? That's Oil City. Yep, Oil City. That's Warren. So the water used to flow to Lake. All the water used to flow to Lake Erie. All these, all these water systems. It was the Middle Allegheny, the Eastern Allegheny, and the Western Allegheny, and all flowed to Lake Erie. But when the ice, oops, that one way. But when the ice moved down, came down. There was no way for that, nowhere for that water to go up, so it changed course and all started going south. And that's the water system we have now. So what they decided, what they thought was the best, Morgan's best plan was, if we just take this water here and just divert it into Chautauqua Lake, then Chautauqua Lake could drain right into Lake Erie. Because that's basically where the line is that flows north and flows south. So that was... Any questions on prehistory of Kinsey Dam? There's a lot more into it. I know I've read quite a bit into it and it gets really interesting to get into. Yes, question. Was the Seneca Nation compensated? Um, the Seneca Nation was compensated. Um, they, moved, they moved all the the houses out, well they didn't move the houses, but they moved all the people. They set them up in Salamanca, they built them houses, they, they once again the Seneca Nation don't, don't believe they got good compensation. They got housing, which is not the housing they wanted. They didn't have their life off the land like they had before. They were all put into communities that like we have today, so they weren't real happy. Um, they had to get all the, uh, move all the cemeteries, and they all put all the cemeteries up into New York. So. That, that I must say, was years before the Seneca Nation operated gambling. Yep, exactly. It's long before the, long before the, they got into that. Yes. Is it true that uh, Chief Corn Planter's remains had to be remo uh, moved to another location? They believe, I've heard multiple that they say they have moved corn planters grave and it is on site at the burial cemetery that is up there by Willow Bay. I forget, the corn planter cemetery. It's on the east side. On the east side, yep. Above the dam. Above, yep, on, yep. It's right above the New York border there, New York, Pennsylvania line. And they say that's where his body, but you know, there's still people that say that no, that wasn't his body, and they didn't ever build it. But they this said they did have to move. They did have to. Made. Yeah, they did have to Just move. Just like the stories about Chief Thompson, some people said his body was never found after he was killed by General in the battle with General Lee and Henry Harrison's soldiers, and then others said his body was found. But the actual truth is, his body was found. So there are Always conflicting stories. That's the great thing about history. You just never know. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Let's get into the construction of the dam. 1960, 1965. Five years to build is all it took. Cost to build, $108 million. This is the site that they picked to build the dam. Got the hillsides and the river. Of course, you had the river. <laughs> um, this is looking downstream at it. Uh, this kind of gives you an idea of the water, the flows down. This was the original way you got into town, was across this bridge into Warren. But then they had to put another road across here to keep the people on that side of the river. Um, but this was where the beginning of the dam here, and it would go across this way. Um, of course, there's multiple towns upstream that got that got flooded out in the building of the dam. You had the town of Kinzu, Kinzu. you had the town of Corian, Corridan that got flooded out, and of course the Seneca Nation's tribal homes. So this is April 1961. They're beginning to build the spot. Then by August 1961, you can start seeing that they're starting to build 
the earthen side. That's one of the neat things about Kinzu is half of the dam is concrete structure and the other part is rolled earth. So it was like a mixture of two dam building types. So I, of course I've got, that gives me three times of things to worry about because I got the connection between the two and I got everything you have to worry about about the one type of dam and everything you have to worry about the other type of dam. So I get it all. <laughs> um, by November 1961, the dam, they started diverting the water. So you had to divert the water around where you're working and stick it into a small channel so that you could start building your structure. And these are just, you can watch it as they go by 62, September 62, they're getting further along. And it's also a 1962 picture, they got the train tracks built so that they could run the cranes across to move the cement. Got your batch plant to make your cement to build your dam. And here you start seeing more. This is the, the earthen part of the dam being constructed. And then they're starting the concrete section by 62. Um, these are the outlet structures. This is the, oops. These are the, uh, the blocks that use when the water comes out of the dam, it diverts, to, kind of mixes up the water so it doesn't erode the base. So those are your, and also picture those, those blocks there. So that's out your water coming out of the dam, your dam structure. Getting it further along, I actually found a lot of these photos in our dam our inspection photos so that they could show everybody how the dam was built. So I thought that would be interesting. Winter 63, we're moving along. And by April 63, starting to see more of the, the water coming through, more of the line of what's being built. May of 63, starting to get some of the towers built. I was trying to figure out how I was going to delete that off of that file, <laughs> but basically that's something that the, uh, the engineers wanted to know about whenever they were building the dam. So basically what that did was it was able to relieve whenever they were starting to put the pressure of the water behind the dam, they were able to relieve some of that pressure by this well, and it was able to tell them how much pressure was coming up behind the dam by the water. I'm um, getting further along. Start seeing it starting to take shape here. There's the roadway, the 59 road here. Dam, the top of the dam come across is where the river are. The river, the main channel is where our, where we release the water. These are, this eventually would, would fill in the whole way, so. This is looking from the north side, looking down across the dam. Starting to see more shape to it. It's building up more of the earth inside of it. This is looking downstream. More pictures downstream, downstream. You start seeing this is this is where the side ends and this is the riprap and the earthen section will come and meet that up eventually. By the winter of 64, they're almost complete. The earth is coming up and this is April 65. This kind of gives you a good look at our, the gates that we have. We have eight gates total in the dam. Six of them, six lower gates. 
and two upper gates. Then these are our overflow, the spillway gates in case we get too much water and the water comes up high, then those gates get operated. But those are just for emergency <coughs> gates. This is looking upstream to the dam. Once again, you can see those. There's the sluices, the six lower gates sluices, the two upper gate sluices, and those are your trunnion gates for your emergency spillway. There we are, May 1966. Ready to go, filling it up. It took 3.5 million cubic yards of concrete and earth fill to build. It's 179 feet above the original stream bed from the top of the dam, that original stream bed is 179 feet. So actually the water level right now, it's filled in probably about nine feet since the dam was built. So it's about 170 feet from the top of the dam to the bottom of the, bottom of the lake. Uh, it's 1,877 feet long. It's the concrete section is 179 feet wide. The earthen section is 1,050 feet wide. There are eight gates, five foot eight inches by 10 foot. And two upper gates are six, there are the two uppers and the six lowers. And then there's four spill spillway gates or the 24, the emergency spillway gates are 24 by 45. So how we adjust for flows of the river is by how much we open each one of those, those gates up. So if I went up there right now, we're releasing approximately 4,000 CFS, which 4,000 CFS for us is, is a small amount, but you gotta figure a CFS is the size of a basketball. So right now we're le releasing 4,000 basketballs per second coming out of the dam. Um, and that's with two gates, two of the lower gates open six feet each. So they're not even open all, that's just two of the gates. So we've got the eight gates that we can actually operate plus the two upper ones. The most that's ever been released out of the dam is 25,000 CFS. Just 25, once again, 25,000 basketballs per second. <laughs> Um, just recently, we were at 18,000. That's kind of our go-to rate to empty out quickly. The idea is to empty out when we get a rainstorm. The idea is behind the behind flood control. As you get a rainstorm, you don't change the amount you're releasing. You keep it the same. When that rainstorm is gone, the next day, the water coming off the hillsides in a normal in the normal area has is all going downstream so at that point we can open up our gates and start releasing so we want to release our water as fast as we can so we're ready for the next event because we get too much water behind there then we end up in trouble because you never know what's going to happen any other questions so far yes cost it was cheaper, rolled earth is cheaper than concrete. And when you're building a thousand feet long, it was much cheaper to do it half and half. And I think the engineers wanted a challenge. You know, they built the other ones all the same. Let's try to do both. Engineers are like that. What's that circle? I'm going to discuss that in a minute. What's the highest level it's ever been in full of water? I mean, the max. Um, our max pool level is, right now, our summer pool level is 13. We go by sea level. So our, our right now, we're at 1310, which is 1,310 feet above sea level. Our summer pool is 1328. We lower the, we lower the pool in the wintertime because of how volatile it is if you have a rainstorm with a lot of snowpack and you don't have the plants and the trees to suck up the water, you get a lot of water real quick. It's amazing the difference between the amount of water it goes into the reservoir when you have leaves on trees when you don't have leaves on tree. It's such a vast difference. But so we'll go to 1328 in the summertime. Our top of our max pool is 1364. 
and the most we've got was 1345, and I'll show you a picture of that in a few. Yes? It might be again folklore. <laughs> Supposedly, uh, the nation, the Seneca Nation, put a curse on the dam. Of course. <laughs> perfidity, right. late perfidity. Is there any truth to that? <laughs> no, not that I know of. I haven't seen the aliens landing. I haven't seen the uh, Kinzu Loch Ness monster. Um, let's see what so some of the other ones. As I remember, as a, a youngster, you driving up 59, there was all types of posters. Oh, really? Billboards and oh, there were people. You know, the Seneca Nation was up in arms. Oh, they still are. You know, it's not still not a. <laughs> they still don't like us that much, but. You did not confirm or. I cannot confirm nor deny the <laughs> the uh, landings of aliens at our dam. No. What the, one of the things I used to say that they go in, they were the Corps of Engineers was afraid to go into the water because of the stuff they saw. Don divers have seen down there. No. <laughs> stocks for the dam were actually built in Warren, the Pittsburgh, Des Moines Steel. Oh, really? And the daughter of the flange press operator in that plant was a classmate of mine, and she was in several of my classes up there. Hmm. And all that, all that st fabricated steel for the, for the uh, gates and also the pen stocks was done in Warren, the Pittsburgh, Des Moines. You know, kind of neat little iron work in Pittsburgh. You know the uh, Gateway Arch. And yes, they did the, they did the Gateway Arch in St. Louis. It's done by yeah, in Warren. Yeah, correct. Yep. Yes? It must be some creative engineering where the concrete paints the earth. Yeah, basically it's, if you've seen the pictures behind, back. They kind of see right here, they've built... They built the wall back in, then the earth comes up to it. So it's actually underneath. So it overlaps. It's overlaps it. And they actually built another thing that I didn't mention earlier. Out here, they built a wall underneath to make sure the water doesn't get underneath that structure. What they call a cutoff wall. And if you ever read anything about what they're doing out at East Branch, they're doing some cutoff wall work there because East Branch had myriads of holes throughout the dam. From, so they drilled holes down through the dam and filled it up with concrete to build a wall to keep the water from going through there. And we just spent multi-billion dollars, 123 billion dollars to fix, no, was it? Ah, don't quote me on that, no quotes. <laughs> But they just spent a lot of money at East Branch. They're just about done. All right. Question. Yeah, when, <coughs> when they built the pump station uh -huh. for the electric, they had to retrofit it because I didn't think anything in the dam itself was integral to it. It was like added. Right. It was added on later. So um, the original thought that they were going to put hydropower on there, but they didn't. So it was actually a couple years later after the dam was built and completed before they started the whole hydropower add-on. Question? Do you have 100% control of the outflow yourself there at the dam, or is there some other communication on downriver that says, hey, do this or don't do this? They tell us what to do. Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh has, uh, they have a staff of, I believe it's six, Hydro engine, hydraulic engineers that study all the, all the rivers, all the weather charts. They know what's coming in. They know what all of them's going to be releasing at one time. And they tell us exactly what they need to do, what we need to do. So, yeah, I don't make that call myself. I let them do it that way. They get in trouble, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I get enough trouble when people want, I wanted to go kayaking this weekend and the water's too high. I'm like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have my job. Yes. How many people worked on the project? Boy, that I couldn't tell you. I don't know what the exact number was. They were. I'm sure they were. The numbers were in and out because you had one company in, one company out, and yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry. 
Any other questions? All right, so this little circle here is part of the pump storage hydropower. So the dam was built across. When they decided to add the pump storage hydropower, they added this little entity here. It shoots out from the dam, and it's just a little block building that goes down, and it has piping to it, which I believe the piping is two what they call penstocks, which are 15 foot in diameter. So pretty big things that, where they suck the water out of the reservoir through this structure, which is the structure just the gates that open up and close, because they also have upper gates and lower gates. And the reason we have upper gates and lower gates is so that when we, if we just had lower gates and they just sucked off the lower gates, in the summertime, when water warms up, the top of the water gets warm and the bottom water gets cold. And it gets striates. And if we were just to release the water off the bottom of the dam, the Allegheny River would be 40 degrees year round, which would be very cold. So the upper gates is what we use mostly in the summertime. That takes the water off the top of the top of the pool which makes it about 60, 70 degrees all summer long. So once we get above, sometimes we get above 70, but they don't like us to get above 70 because trout don't like water temperature above 70 degrees. So they try to keep us in that time frame, in that range. But the mollusk, the endangered mussels don't like the water that's real cold. So we kind of got to play that game with our wildlife. Um, so. So they have upper and lower gates so that they can run the water. So this kind of gives you an idea. Right. That storage area up on the hill built? Uh, that was put up there probably, I think it was 1967. So it was shortly after, it was like two years, three years after the dam was built that they built that pump storage. So basically in the, what they do is in the, uh, at night, when water on electric prices are low, they have one big, one of the big generators down at the power plant. They hook it up to the grid, the electrical grid, and they start turning it, and they pump the water out of the reservoir, run it down the hill to their little pump storage building down below, and they pump that water up the hill into this reservoir. And they store it up in that reservoir. It basically takes them six hours to pump the water from, the res from our reservoir up to their reservoir. So then once, usually during the daytime, sometimes early morning, whenever. Winter time they usually do it in the early morning because that's when people are getting up, heating their houses, and that's when energy costs are high. Or late afternoon, afternoon, late afternoon in the summertime when everybody's trying to cool their houses and businesses are functioning. When they need the electricity, they'll bring that water back down this hill. Oops. Oh, geez. They'll bring the water back down the hill, run it through their generators, make electricity, then pump that water back into the reservoir again and run it back and we'll run it downstream. So. Um, they have three generators in the dam. One generator is basically just for their service generator. It's a real small generator. It's just made to power up the other generators and also makes a little bit of electricity during the day, but it's basically to power up their own generators. And they have two big ones. One big one is the one they use to pump up to the reservoir. It can only be used to pump water back into the big reservoir. Their second big generator, they can use it to either pump water back into this reservoir or pump it down into the river. But they very seldom pump it down in the river because they have to match our flows because we tell them how much that gets released into the river. And if we're not at that critical point, then they'll have to put the water back up in the reservoir because they can't go above what we're telling them they can release, so. 
Um, each one of those, they're gener they can make 400,000 kilowatts per hour out of those generators. Each one? No, but all, all together. So they do pretty good for themselves. You know, you think that, oh yeah, it takes them power to run it up there, so they're losing money, but they're making, making good money. I go into detail, but I'd probably get in trouble. <laughs> um, some of the items right there is, the, is their building that they operate. Right here is the uh, fish hatchery. It's been updated since then. You'll probably see just the Quonset huts are there now. Uh, Nas National Fish and Wildlife, they have a fish hatchery there that they lease the land off of us to run their hatchery. They raise lake trout for Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. All right, so what we're talking about before, October 4th, 1972, shortly after the dam was built. So you figured the dam was finished in 65, so it wasn't too long after the dam was built. Anybody remember, know what that date is? Yeah. Hurricane Agnes. Yep, that was Agnes. So that's how much water that, that tested the dam right from the get-go, that it could, could do the job. So you can see those gates are, the water's up on those emergency spillway gates. They opened them up a little bit, they actually ran the emergency spillway gates just a little bit. They didn't actually open them up too far, but just enough that they actually did try them. Is that above the level you told me they sustained us? Right. That was way above. Way above. It was almost a full pole. Okay. It was almost, like I said, it was... 1364 is our, our, our full pull where we can't go over, we start overflowing and it's not a good if we overflow. Um, and that was 13, I think it was 1342 is where we ended up during Hurricane, Hurricane Agnes. How much of a rainfall would it take to put it over the top? Um, I was gonna go into that in a minute. I don't have the exact figure, but I was gonna go over that here in a minute few minutes so so far this is during Hurricane Agnes too that's showing that the one one spillway gate being used emergency spillway gates all the other lower gates are being used it doesn't have it was October I'm not sure why they weren't using the other two upper gates I haven't quite never quite figured that one out I tell a good question but I wasn't wasn't around at that time I was around, but I wasn't up here. <laughs> had nothing to do with it. Um, so far, it was actually been in the paper just recently. 1.3 billion in damages has been pre prevented since Kinzu Dam, saved by Kinzu Dam being built. So your investment of 108 million back in, 19, in the 1960s has made you 1.3 billion. So. Uh, this is a couple more, just a few photos. Kind of give you an idea. This is our, you can kind of see this is our normal summer pool water here. And those, during her, Agnes, it was up in here. Kind of give you a better look at the four gates. Just some pretty pictures that they am. So you can tell by this picture, just kind of looking at this picture, you know, huh? The grass is green, but the water's only coming out of the lower gates. So we know it's early in the spring because in the summertime, we're at least out of the upper gates. Actually, I know it was April because this is when they did the, uh, all these pictures were from the uh, periodic inspection. Every five years, we have to go through a major inspection where they send up at least a dozen and a half engineers come from throughout the country and come and visit the dam and go through it a fine tooth comb and look at everything to make sure it's safe. We have yearly inspections, but the five years is quite daunting. So here you can, whoops, here you can see this is the hydropower part where they're sucking the water for the hydropower. You can see that they had just a little bridge between. So when they built it, 
It was a little add-on add that wasn't part of the structure. Uh, this is just looking across the road, top of the roadway, looking out towards the towards 59. So, probably you'll see something coming up shortly. It's going to make the news here within the next, I'm guessing, within the next month. Um, originally, when the dam was built, this is our how they rate the dams throughout the country. Every dam has a rating system that's called a DSAC rating. It's, it's a classification of what kind of urgency action plan needs to be for each dam that's built. So five is basically your normal dam, basically very new dams and are operating perfectly are a five. Your next level, is a level four. Right now we're considered a moderate as a three, which is basically, yeah, there's a little concern, but not that much of an issue. And then you have the uh, desac rating of two, oops, desac rating of two, which is their potential to very high incremental danger. Then you have the very high, which is a one. Um, they do these, basically it's, is there something wrong with your dam? Is there a chance that the dam could fail? Or is if, and it also puts into, if something happens to your dam, how much life and property could be lost if your dam was to fail? So we're actually at a three right now, which is, is we've been a three since basically the dam was built because of the size of the dam and the amount of population downstream of the dam. You've got Warren, which is, if the dam breaks, Warren's got 45 minutes to get out before we're full flood. Um, downtown Pittsburgh's got 40 hours. So they got time to get out of get out of Dodge, but we'll send them underwater. <laughs> How much water are they figure going down to Warren? Uh, basically, they figure looking at the flood inundation maps, there'll be water up to Walmart. So we're talking not to scare you, not, to <laughs> but. Um, and they are changing our desac rating from a three to a two. And not saying that there's anything new wrong with the dam. The dam is the same as it's ever been. It's still functioning correctly. But they're looking at pro the, the property and life possibility lost. Of course, there's more from the last time that they, when they said it, there's more people living between down on the Allegheny River throughout, you know, throughout history. Of course, whenever they built the dam, there wasn't that much population. Now population's growing. And weather is in a changing fad. We know that, we watch the news, we all know that weather is more funky than it used to be. They figure if we get multiple hurricanes back to back, that come up and hit the area, we wouldn't have enough, our spillway space, the amount of these gates can handle, wouldn't be enough to get the water out and the dam could overtop, uh, which would be not good. But what's the chance of multiple, you know, we've never had that issue at ever. You know, this, like I said, the 72, Hurricane Agnes, the water came up and they weren't even using all the gates to get rid of the water. Yes. Are you familiar with uh, Kynesta? Yes. Yeah, you know, there's a built-in overflow. Right. Uh, there's no type of built-in overflow no. for here? No, I don't know why they, and that's, that's, I think, is going to be the fix at some point. Because if you ended up putting 
an overflow back in this corner so that the water could come down across. Of course, you might release the lake trout into the river, but, <laughs> but they'll be fine. <laughs> but that would be, that would probably be the fix that they'll end up looking into. You know, the first step is to identify, identify a problem and then come up with a solution. So right now we're at the process of identifying that there is going from a DSEC 3 to a DSEC 2 is getting the attention of Congress and the powers that be to start looking into saying, okay, we need to do something here. What are we going to do? So, yes. Well, unfortunately, every dam that has been built as of, they all built their dams around 1939, and they all gave them a life expectancy of 50 years. Kinsey has been around for 52, <laughs> or actually 50, 54. So yeah, you know, most of the dam, you look at Tynesta, Tynesta just had their 75th anniversary. Um, Loyal Hannah just had their 75th. Uh, I think Mosquito's having their 75th this year. Shenango is the same age as Kinzu. Um, they're all about the same, you know, they're all 50 to 75 years old. And that's throughout the country. They're all about the same age. And they're just, you know, that's the life expectancy they, they gave them when they built them. But they, they're doing just fine. You know, there's no, no issues with... I don't know. You'd have to do something, probably build something in front of it, then take that one apart. You know, tear that one, you know, let that one erode. Now that I've scared y'all, any questions? <laughs> Let me at least get to my end slide, my pretty slide. <laughs> when it got real low there a couple of years ago where you could walk across up there where the Indians used to own the land. Okay. What was the pool level in? Was it really, they must have really down. Yeah, I don't know for sure what, you know, it was, it hasn't been that low since I've been there. You know, it hasn't got low, to me, since I've, I've been there since 2012, so I haven't been there that long. And my history goes, that's as far as my history goes back with Kinzu. And I know we've never got below 1305, it which are 1302. Boys, boys oh, really? <laughs> yes, question. Was that much habitat, uh, American Eagles? Anything you could tell us about the eagles? To see? Um, we see, I see eagles probably about once, probably once or twice a day. Uh -huh. This should uh, be coming back now. Oh, yeah. Um, right now they're nesting, so we don't see them a lot. But we still see a few juveniles flying around. Um, there is a probably about three nesting sites within the site of the dam that we know of that hold eagles. And every year we have the eagle watch, which sometimes we see eagles, sometimes we don't. But usually see eagles at some sort, sometime during the day. We do that in February. But yeah, I had. I can probably show you one on my cell phone. I got pictures on my cell phone, didn't put it on here, but I had a, a juvenile eagle that was like sitting on a railing outside my office window. It was just kind of hanging out there. He decided that, I don't know if he got yelled at by his mom and dad, but he quit hanging out on a railing. I don't know. Yes? I don't know if it was when Agnes froze the pool, but what's the bridge height of the Southern Tier Expressway Oh, really? So I don't know. I don't know for sure. I'd have to look that up. I don't know for sure what that, that height elevation was. But they built it after the dam was built, so they knew what the, what the level would be. You know, everything around there is built uh, to what Kins is going to do, what the reservoir's potential of doing. So they put, when they put the cemetery in, okay, the pool's going to, th here's 1364, we got to build above that level. You know, this building goes here, this is 1364, so it has to be here. So everything was built that, yeah, this is as far high as Kinsu's going. If it gets above 
you know, if the water gets above 1364, then it ain't going to get any higher because the dam <laughs> is going to get <laughs> thrown away. So when the dam's operating, is there one generator during the day running or is there... No, they will turn it off. They never turn it off? They, they will turn the generators off. They're, they only run them that certain until they can dry, drain that reservoir out, which is basically six hours a day. Bring it back down. Double the output, or during the day, or do you use more electricity? Right. So the basically the idea is to pump it up there during the night. Then during the day, you empty that big reservoir out. Every day. Every day. Then fill it back up again at night. It's just a peaking station. It's just a peaking station. Yep. So. so it, well, nothing's connected to the dam itself. Because when they built the dam, there was not enough. You make power by the amount of, by as fast as you can turn that turbine. And to turn that turbine, you need the water to be up high. And the, you know, dropping 100 feet from where the dam drops water to a turbine wasn't enough height to make that turbine spin enough to make it feasible to have a hydropower system. So the only way to make it feasible was put the water way up high to bring it way down to make the generator spin faster. Are you allowed to go look at that reservoir? Um, there's a fence around it, but you can get up to the fence and there's probably a road width away. You know, there's the fence, there's a road width, then the pool, the, it's kind of neat because 100 acre reservoir, it's kind of a neat little thing. A couple years ago on your website, you said something about a day of the week you could book a tour to go inside of the dam. Are you still doing that? We, if you give us a call at the number at the office and if you've got a group, we like to do, you know, a family group of, you know, 10 to 15. You know, we don't want to do a husband and wife combo come out, and, but make an arrangement. We have to run names through anyone over 18 and over has to be run through our security system to make sure that we don't have anybody coming in that are terrorists or anything. So you got to make get past security. So we have to get a copy of your I, your ID. We send it down to Pittsburgh. He runs it through his system, and then we can let you in. We give a tour. That, that's where you'll get the ranger, not me. <laughs> yes? I found some stuff that won my parents. They um, actually cut self guiding ports of the dam back in the Oh, yeah. They used to have the dam, top of the dam used to be open to the public. You used to be able to, just to uh, fish down below and behind the, where the, where the uh, power plant is, fish right there. You could walk up to the top of the dam and just walk back and forth all the time. But, yeah, can't do that anymore. The top of the dam, they closed that back in the 80s where you could walk through the dam all by yourself. Then probably back in the 80s, I think they closed that down. Then 9-11 then is when they closed the top of the dam down to the public. And there's still thoughts open to that back up to the public, you know, if we can do some more security changes. Yes? Well, who provides the security up there? Is it 24-7? No. Um, we're there during the day, then we, we, ha we do, summer times we do hire the Warren County sheriffs to patrol, but as for all the time, no. I'm giving away secrets, I probably shouldn't be. <laughs> but you got to be very, you know, to make something happen to the dam, to make things get ugly, you know, you're talking concrete that's... 15, 20 foot thick. Ain't gonna, ain't gonna. Yeah, you do. I remember when I was working with some engineers during one, after, right or after 9 11, and I was working at a dam out in Oregon. I don't know if you heard of Chief Joseph Dam. It's out in Oregon. It's along the Columbia River. It's one of the largest, it is the Corps' largest hydropower plant. Instead of this little dinky one, it has two generators, it has 27 generators. It produces, and they said if, it, if the terrorists got a hold of an airplane and ran it into the side of the dam, we'd have to scrub the soot off the side of the dam, and that would be it. Because <laughs> it wouldn't, wouldn't affect it at all. That's that much thick of concrete. It's, you know, and what are you going to do? You're going to open up a gate, and that's just going to let a little bit of water out. So. <laughs> How many 
people are up there that work full time, you know, beside you in the park right here. Yeah, how many are. There's, like I said, there's two maintenance person, two maintenance Just people. Like I said, is when you started. Yep, that's it. There's four of us that, that operate that dam. So, plus you got the power plant too. They have, a, they have, they probably have about 30 people to work in the power plant down below, and they have their somebody there 24/7. It kind of keeps an eye on what's going on out there. You know, they have cameras that they can see if something's something's going on out there. So they know what's going on. I didn't realize that they, when they were going generating the power, that they pumped the water back into the uh, to the dam. I just assumed it went into the river. But if you're standing there looking at the dam, or you see, and the water is actually boiling around that end tank, is that the water coming back into the dam? If you're standing looking at the cement structure that they put in, oh yeah, and in you see the water going yeah, back yeah, up. Yeah, that's, 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 that's the water coming that back up. up. Yeah, that's what. Through that structure. And yeah. That back into the reservoir yeah everybody asked me i'll be leaving work or i'll be out on the deck talking to somebody it's like why is the water going upstream <laughs> but that's them bringing the water back that they just made electricity out of yes you mentioned that when they pump the water up at night uh they actually buy that electric from the grid Did I hear you yeah that? yep so they buy the electric from the grid to pump it up and then when it comes back down at higher price is that where they make their money on the spread yeah. then yeah, and it's, it's, it, it takes, right, and they do make, it's more money because, I don't know, it just seems because, I don't know, I, that's how they make their money because it's during the daytime when the off hours and high hours are where they make their money. All right. And I'm not sure if it's cheaper to pump it up than the amount that they make bringing it back down. I don't know for sure, but I know that it's a multi-million dollar operation down there so they're doing pretty well because I know a couple years ago they had to relicense Federal Energy Commission is what regulates them so they're kind of on their own answering to the Federal Energy Regulation Company so they're the ones that oversee what they do and we had relicensing and First Energy wanted to buy it and the Seneca Nation wanted to buy it and run it themselves but eventually First Energy sold off to this LS Power during the bid process. LS Power bought it, ended up giving enough stipend to the Seneca Nation. The Seneca Nation said, we're good. And they walked away from running it. So there must be enough money involved that they could give the Seneca Nation money to, to go away so they get the license themselves. Yes? Mm -hmm. yep. um, the police chief in Oil City told us that the water would be hit high at West 3rd Street in Oil City. And my father used to work for Roswell Borough. And somebody from FEMA told him that if there was ever a failure of him to be on the water at the intersection of uh, Main Street and Sherry Run Road, right? And 27 Roswell would be 8 feet deep. Okay. I'd have to look at my inundation maps. I don't know for sure. But yeah. Trivia. Yep, trivia. Yep, yep, yep. All right, any other questions? What do they do with all the debris that comes after a storm, all the trees, and how do they get that out of there? We don't see a whole lot of debris. You know, we get a few branches and a few trees eventually, eventually falls down. But we have the, I don't know if you can see it on that picture, but see the orange log boom. It catches debris before it gets to the dam. And it usually just, We'll sit on that debris until our boom breaks, which is a normal occasion. But it's supposed to just lay there and eventually rots and sinks to the bottom. I remember after Hurricane Agnes, Camp Olmstead, there was a lot of firewood for camp. <laughs> yep. I, yeah. Yeah, it goes, it goes in a lot of the coves upstream, but we don't see a whole lot at the dam. You know, I've been at other projects, other dams throughout the country where it's just inundated with debris, but we don't see a whole lot. At Kinzu. You know, we got a few that are few trees right now that are laying on the on the riprap above the dam that's just laying there that we have to get out and burn one of these days. But yes. Does the Nation have any authority at all on the water or on the shorelines up on their property? 
Yep, they they basically we owe, we basically have the rights to the water, but they also have shared rights to the water up there. So you have to have you fish up there. You have to have a Seneca Nation fishing license, tribal fishing license to fish up there. They actually oversee that. They have a law enforcement group patrols their waterways, but we're also up there too. So, but you know, it's just a joint control. So they do have. Anybody else? Go once, go on twice. Yes. You said if the dam overflowed, it would be bad news. Yes. Does that mean that if you were to get enough water to overflow the dam, it would be a complete failure? Um, that's, you know, you got to put into account how much water, how much it goes over. Let me just get a good picture here. So basically what they're worried about is the water gets up so high it will top this area in here. So then the water would go across this road and down this hillside. So if enough water starts, keeps going over this hillside, then it's going to start eroding away the backside of this, this grassy area and more and more and it will the dam will get thinner and thinner and then it might break through. But it's going to take an awful lot of water to get to that point. You know, Hurricane Agnes, we got, you know, we didn't even start using our emergency spill ga gates, which are 24 by, what did I say, 24 by 53 to let water go. And they weren't using all the other gates and we still never got up to that point. But if you've got three, four hurricanes coming through New York and heading towards us or coming up the coast and coming straight inland and hitting the drainage, the 2,000 acre, 2,100 square acre waterway that we're protecting and that hits multiple times, then we could be in trouble. But... The chances of that are, you know, we haven't seen it in the 50 years that we've been here. Right. Yeah, exactly. Well, I live in Youngsville, so, you know, I look at that map going, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to have to have to move also. But, but yeah, they say, yeah, come into work. And I'm like, yeah, okay, what am I going to do? Wave bye-bye? <laughs> So basically, our war, the how we operate is we'll get on the as soon as we know something's going wrong, or is there a potential to go something wrong, or something imminent. If there's something imminent, then we contact your emergency management for the county emergency management, and they send out the calls to who needs to be notified. They have all that information. They have the flood inundation plans on their desk for Kinzu, and they know exactly. Each county on down the line has that information. So we basically contact your emergency management for the county. I think I know the answer for um, the police chief also said I think Coral City would have five hour lead time. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I think this area is five hours, six, question, hours, six hours. Was, you said they didn't build the dam back in the 20s, 30s because of the trees. Right. Is it always part of the plan that also that was. Um, Pinesta and all the other dams on the tributary, all part of the same plan, or was this, did they realize that it was going to be not going to be developed? No, they, it was all part of that major plan was to put all these on the tributaries to the river to slow down the amount of water coming in, so that's where they started. This was just the final. This was just the final part of it. You know, they were going to avoid doing it. They wanted to avoid doing it, but then, you know, the powers that be and the political influence said, no, we need it. You know, we need to save Pittsburgh from any flooding. So, and we needed the water for navigation. <laughs> but, yes. What's the widest part of the earth in section? Widest part of the earth in section is a thousand feet wide. I had that back here somewhere. Oh, I thought that was the section. Thousand fifty feet is wide. Uh, concrete's a little less, but 
So, you know, most of that, you know, if we look at, at a concrete section, you look at the amount of pressure behind the dam and the water, the pressure coming up, and we have all kinds of monitors within the dam. It tells us if there's any kind of lifting up from the water getting underneath the dam, and there isn't. We look at the water coming in through the, the earthen part, and we don't see anything of any weird things in that area either. It's just the fact that if we get all those rainstorms. Yes? There's tunnels. Um, you know, we've got stairways going down. We have a tunnel at the very bottom. We have a tunnel at the operation gallery. But other than that, it's, it's pretty solid the whole way through. Anything else? All right. Thank you much. Hope I didn't scare you too bad.